This is test three of Bellavia, our AI and human crew submarine. It was a wild one. Hey, JP here. We conducted our third in the water test of our submarine, Bellavia, and what a ride. It was a tangle of blinding sun, a dose of politics, and a CO2 spike all bundled around a road trip. Let me start at the beginning. We had to put Bell in the water at a new location. We got kicked out of the local lake by the parks department. They cited the submarine accident at the Titanic 3,000 miles away as the reason. It didn't matter that the lake is only 15 feet deep. It didn't matter that all we were doing is floating at the dock testing systems. It didn't matter that the sub is licensed and legal to operate in California waterways. At this very body of water, there is a shocking number of accidents caused by drunk boaters. Yet, that's still okay. But thank goodness they stopped JP Aerospace from floating a submarine by the dock. Everything we do seems to require a legal battle. Everything we do is legal. Our airships, balloons, rockets, we do them all by the book. We fill out the forms, file the considerable mounds of paperwork, do all the notifications, and get inspected by all the required authorities. But every single one requires a fight. The ironic thing is that I'm a big believer in regulations. This stuff needs to be done right and the rules help make it safe. The problem is no one wants to sign off on something different. The CYA is heightened to such an incredible level. Well, we are different and we are the little guy. So all the agencies, federal, state, and local, will go out of their way to say no. However, we possess a superpower, a staggeringly annoying level of persistence, and we always get our clearance in the end. We're going to fight this one more on the principle than anything else. But in the meantime, we found a new launch site to test Bell. It's a deep water ramp in a more industrial area. All good. The drawback is that it's an hour and a half away. Road trip. The highway we need to go down to get there is one of the ruddiest in California. So this is going to be a literal shakedown test. The other major change we made to the sub before this test was the keel weights. For the keel weights, we had 600 pounds of concrete pavers in the bottom of the frame of the sub. We replaced them with steel plates after test two. The steel plates only weigh a little bit more, but they take up a lot less volume than the concrete pavers. Less volume equates to less water displacement and therefore less buoyancy. The whole upshot is that we added 300 pounds to the effective weight of the sub. On the surface, the water line needed to be three inches deeper, and that should do it. The purpose of test three was to see how the sub does on long trailering, to try out the new site, and to conduct a basic float, trim, and balance check after the big weight change. To get ready for the road, we modified the strapping on a lot of the external components, like the batteries, to be more secure. This was the first time on the freeway, and the sub and the trailer handled great. In spite of the potholes and the general rough road, the sub did not budge from its spot on the trailer. However, things were not well inside the sub. About a dozen things broke loose or shifted out of place. In about a half an hour after we got there, we got it all sorted out, or so we thought. We got the sub into position on the ramp, I climbed in, and the team started working the checklist. That's when we discovered a new and completely unexpected problem, glare. 
This boat ramp was right in the direct sun and the glare was pretty bad. I could not see the screen nor read my printed checklist. I could cup my hands around my eyes and see each individual instrument. So we moved ahead. However, when we put the sub and me in the water, not only was there the direct glare, but the sun was also reflecting off the water and right at window height. It was a bit like snow blindness. Not only could I not see the monitor, but I couldn't see my own hands, let alone read the checklist or the instruments. If there are problems with the systems, Bella will tell me verbally and I can respond verbally with the exception of life support data. We went old school, rock solid analog instruments for the life support data. This was great for reliability. However, this means that the O2, CO2 levels, oxygen percentage, and the like are not tied into the computer. And with the glare, I can't read the dials. However, the instruments do have alarms for when things get into the bad range, but there was a bigger problem happening at the same moment. The sub is not floating right. She's too deep in the water and it just feels wrong. The submarine is caught on the trailer. At the time, I don't know this. The windows are one inch polycarb. I can't hear a thing about what's going on outside, but I can tell there's a problem. I can see that the team is in action. Brian is in the water doing something I can't see behind me. I can tell everyone is working a problem. For me, it was an exercise in patience. The last thing the team needs is for me to micromanage them on the radio from inside the sub. They don't really have the time to explain what they're doing to me while fixing the problem. I can't do anything anyway. My job is to sit inside the sub and shut up and listen quietly and let the team do their thing. Let me tell you, it is hard. <laughs> we were so worried about the sub vibrating out of position on the road that we went too far and now it won't come off. In fact, the trailer tires are two feet off the ramp. The whole trailer and submarine strapped together are floating. Well, at least now we know for sure we have plenty of reserve buoyancy. 1100 pound trailer hanging off is not going to sink this sub. While all this is going on, the cabin CO2 levels are climbing. You know, I verify that the life support system is on but the CO2 is still going up. I jump on the radio and read out the numbers as best as I can see them. The CO2 alarms are now going off, indicating that I'm approaching toxic levels. I turn on the emergency life support system that is completely independent, but it doesn't improve things a bit. I work through a complete system reboot as best I could without being able to see, but still, no luck. I'm actually not in any danger. I can always open the hatch. The submarine is not underwater. However, that would violate one of our mission rules and scrub the test completely. The leading cause of accidents in small submarines is open hatch swamping. You have the hatch open and a wave comes by dumping thousands of pounds of water through the hatch and down you go. This is often caused by a passing boat but also bad weather will do it. But really, you're in the water. There will be waves. Even the famous Alvin research submarine has had an open hatch swamping accident. We handle that by never opening the hatch when we're in the water. I get in and out of the sub when it's on the trailer up on the ramp. However, when the CO2 alarms went off, I had my hand up on the hatch wheel just in case. A few moments later, the team had the sub disconnected, then reconnected and locked onto the trailer, and Bella V and I started back up the ramp. Before I had a chance to turn the hatch wheel myself, it was already being spun from the outside, 
and the hatch went up. With everything going on, we didn't get any good video of the sub from the dock. On top of that, the in-cabin cameras failed. We were using cameras that we had retired from our balloon program, but we still thought they would be okay for the shorter subtest. Wrong. It's time to retire them completely. I am asked all the time, how do we pay for all this? One of the ways is with Patreon. It's a cool program. There's a link in the description. Check it out. There was a lot with this test, and we are already into implementing what we learned. Let's start with the CO2 spike. A CO2 scrubber is a pretty simple device. It's a container filled with CO2 absorbing granules. It looks like a bowl of cat litter with a fan on one end. The fan blows the air through the granules and air with less CO2 comes out the other side. Bellavia's life support system uses nine of these units. Now the granules are held pretty tight between the HEPA and the carbon filters. However, if you take one of the units and bang it on the table for an hour, simulating driving on a pothole filled road, the CO2 absorbing granules slump just a little toward the bottom. This creates a gap at the top of the scrubbers and the air passes right on through without any of the CO2 being absorbed. This happened to the primary, the secondary, and the emergency scrubber arrays. You know, just when you think you have isolated independent systems, your submarine will point out that it just isn't so. The solution was to make grids that support the granules, one grid in each scrubber container. To see if it works, we conducted the bang it on the table test for two hours, and it passed with no granule slumping. We modified all nine scrubbers and put in fresh granules, and they are ready to go for the next test. We're doing a few things to handle the bright sun. First, we bought a high intensity monitor that's good for full sun conditions. Second, we're printing out a shade border around the monitor and all the instruments. And lastly, we're installing pull down shades on all the windows. Next, we're beefing up the internal battery mounts. One of the things that broke free on the drive was the forward internal battery. The aft one is fine, but we're putting beefier mounts on both. We're making a latch for the onboard fire extinguisher. This one is tricky. The onboard fire extinguisher is mounted in a sleeve. It's just tight enough not to come out at any angle, but also be very easy to grab and pull blind. If there's an onboard fire, you will likely not be able to see, so we don't want any kind of latch. However, the onboard fire extinguisher came out during the trailer ride and bounced all around the cabin. Not good. We went back and forth on this. It would be easy just to not put it in until we get to the launch site. However, even with a checklist, it's too much of a mission critical item and we don't want any chance of it not being on board. We settled on making a 3D printed latch for the trailering that we will remove as a checklist item on the boat ramp. The latch will be designed so even if it does inadvertently get left on, it'll be easy to remove blind and one-handed. Next, we need a field deployable outside air blower. When we're in the shop and working inside the sub, we have ducting that brings fresh air into the cabin. You know, even with the hatch open, the CO2 levels increase with time. At the launch site, we're not worried about closing the hatch with a slightly elevated CO2 level because the life support system rapidly brings it right down, except when it doesn't. On this test, it would have given us another 10 minutes of good air in the cabin by starting 
at a lower CO2 load. We're going to pass the air ducting through a cooler with ice, and that will make it more comfortable by being a little cooler while we're sitting on the hot ramp. In addition to all that, we're replacing the main onboard PC. The main computer didn't have any problems during the test, but we were already planning an upgrade. Since we're stripping that area of the sub out completely for the instruments already, now is the time. Test three was intense and so many things went wrong. But I gotta tell you, this was the best test so far. Getting deep into the thick of things is never fun at the time, but it's what really drives you forward. With all the changes, we are about a couple of months away from test four. I'm really looking forward to that one. Bell will definitely be more robust and the team is ready for anything. The adventure continues. Thank you for watching. JP Aerospace, America's other space program.